WCBI News at 10 starts now. Thousands of people left in the dark after strong storms blow through late this evening. Thanks for joining us at 10. Over 7,000 four county customers are without power. That's the last check with CEO Brian Clark. Clark says about 20% of their customer base, they do not have electric at this hour. So far, he says they've gotten reports of up to seven broken power poles. Crews are still trying to assess how much and where all that damage is. Clark says all linemen have been called in to begin restoring power. We're going to get the most people back on at once. We have some pockets with five or 600 people out. We're going to get those on first and then work where there's just one and two people out after that. So we're going to do what we can do the most good first. Clark asks if you see a down pole to give them a call. Also be mindful of crews as they work through the night to restore that power. Well, trees are down and water is up across Columbus and Lowndes County. This is a look at a tree that just clipped a home on Burns Circle on Columbus's north side. Burns Circle was also blocked off after a tree fell across the road. High winds blew off or blew over dozens of trees across the friendly city, including 6th Avenue South on Military Road. And I was standing in the kitchen and just heard a loud boom and looked at him by my door and then the uh, tree had fallen on my carport. Yeah. Well, crews are also out working on removing those trees that are blocking area roadways. The strong storms leave parts of Starkville underwater. This afternoon, storms we experienced left parts of Starkville flooded. The flooding affected homes, roads, and apartment complexes. Well, during the flooding, Starkville police advised that residents do not need to go, did not need to go out into the floods, even though most of the water has cleared up. SPD is still advising that if you see water on the road, to not drive through it. Luckily, the drainage systems cleared up and got the water out of the way pretty fast. Winston County was the first in our area to feel the impact of the storm as it moved through. Trees were knocked down all across the southern half of the county, according to EMA Director Buddy King. And in Hawaii, numerous trees fell onto homes and vehicles. Well, down trees have been making road travel hazardous across Noxubee County. Highway 14 west of Macon was closed for a period of time after a large tree fell blocking the road. You see right there, local road crews used chainsaws and heavy equipment to get that roadway clear. It was a similar scene along several other roads in Noxubee and Winston counties, including Highway 15. Damage was also reported to trees and power lines near Mishulaville. Crews have been working hard to get all of those roads back open. Meteorologist Jacob Dickey, he's been tracking these storms all day. He now joins us live in Macon tonight with a look at the damage there. Jacob. Hey Scott, in Macon right now, the rain's still coming down really hard across this area. A lot of flooding in ditches and in low-lying areas, that will still be a concern moving forward. Now when the storms first came through, they came through with a wall of wind and water knocking down lots of trees, as you mentioned, from Winston County all the way through Noxby County into Pickens County and all across the Golden Triangle even. So, uh, here in Macon, local police and fire responded to numerous reports of trees down. In fact, tonight I spoke to a local officer here for the Macon Police. He said that Thank goodness the only damage that happened here was really trees falling down. He had no structural damage to report, no injuries to report. Tonight, north on 145 north of town, there is actually crews working to fix some broken power poles. Of course, areas are power, and tomorrow will be some serious cleanup still from trees that have been blown down from the strong winds. It does look like, though, that most roads in this area are open and clear, though. Still, though, local authorities ask that you take in areas that had strong winds earlier today. Now, reporting live here in Macon, I'm meteorologist Jacob Dickey. We're going to send it over first with meteorologist Jacob Bradley, cast as well as a look at some of the storms today. Hey there, Jacob. Thanks for that report. We are calm across the area now. All that rain has, the severe weather has pushed out a few showers out there, mainly sitting in the upper 50s, lower 60s. Here
Here's those rain showers pulling through. Started off this morning, storms down near Jackson quickly worked their way up into the Golden Triangle region and portions of western Alabama. All of the white dots you see, those are damaging wind reports. You see the little reds down here near Jackson. Those are actually confirmed tornado reports. And unfortunately, we did have one confirmed fatality in Neshoba County. A tree fell on a car as it was traveling down the road. Tonight, none of that severe weather to worry about. We're going to drop down into the lower 50s. And for your Friday, those temperatures are going to stay in the 50s. Coming up a little later in the show, I'll let you know when that sunshine returns and when those temperatures return back to the upper 70s. Scott? Thank you very much, Jacob. Federal grants may be available to help erase train noise and traffic congestion at one of Tupelo's busiest intersections. Mississippi Senator Roger Wicker, Tupelo Mayor Jason Shelton, and representatives from Burlington Northern and Kansas City Southern Railroads took part in a brief meeting at the Crosstown intersection. For decades, people have complained about traffic backups there at Maine and Gloucester. Senator Wicker said there may be some financial help available through rail infrastructure grants, which could help move the switching area further south. There's really no reason why we can't move forward with some grants and some uh, assistance from the federal government to, to make our intersections uh, safe uh, without the uh, blaring horns that, uh, that come through at all times. The cost is just enormous. Uh, but that's why you know we have these great partnerships. Try to work together, uh, apply for the grants, both state and federal. Uh, hopefully, get those uh, financial resources to help. Tupelo city leaders have also explored the possibility of having quiet zones in certain areas, which would help curtail train noise at certain hours of the day. State testing is kicking off in Mississippi schools this week, and it's bringing back the conversation around whether students are being overtested. Courtney Ann Jackson has the latest on what parents and lawmakers are saying. The stress of state testing can be felt within many Mississippi households. Casey McClendon has a fourth grade daughter taking one of those required tests. She doesn't want to go to school. She wakes up crying. She begs me, Mama, please don't do this. And I'm like, you know, you have to take them. Just do the best you can do. For, and. That's all we can do. Thank Representative you, Tom Miles you, tried his hand at introducing several service. bills that would have explored ways to reduce the number of required tests. All of those bills failed this session. Could pass the bill of Mississippi that would be simple that any requirement that we're putting on our students that's not federally mandated, do away with it. And that would do away with a lot of these tests. Now we know that. Just last week, U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos spoke at an education conference and discussed some of the flexibility allowed under the current federal plan known as ESSA. She said, I would encourage more of you to think more broadly about what you might be able to accomplish with an alternative innovative assessment. Back here in Mississippi, parents like Casey McClendon are hoping officials will take that advice sooner rather than later. Do something to take that stress away and just let them learn. A student testing task force was formed at the Department of Education last May to evaluate the number, quality, and types of testing students are taking statewide. Um, I hope that any teachers listening or whatever will understand that your voice is, is being considered and is being heard. Courtney Ann Jackson, WCBI News. And then winter trying to make a return for your Friday highs here. Only in the middle 50s. It's going to be nasty out. More rain showers for tomorrow. Luckily, no severe weather, though. Coming up after the break, I'll let you know when those 70s return to your seven-day forecast. My first alert AccuWeather forecast with meteorologist Jacob Riley. Well, good Thursday evening, friends. We made it through the storms. The lights are still on here in Louisville. On our Viper source, though, we're showing some of those outages out across the region on our county floor map. You see those are pretty widespread here in Lowndes. In Knoxby County, Lynx 2 is also showing some of those outages out there across the region. Here in Kemper County, Winston as well, widespread outages, over 2,600 customers out of power in those two counties. Luckily, though, our uh, linemen are out doing an awesome job getting those back in order. That rain has moved on out of our area. The severe weather has pushed on off into eastern Alabama. We're watching these showers. Those are going to move through overnight tonight on into your Friday. Nothing severe expected out of that. So we are done with our severe threat. We saw some pretty good flash flooding all across the region today. This coming out of Starkville. Special thanks to Mr. Trent Fur for sending that in to us. We saw a lot of tree damage as well. Here's a whole root ball of the bottom of a tree completely blown out of the ground. We had a lot of strong damaging winds out there across the region today. 
All that did come to a pleasant end, though. You can see this rainbow here out of Clarkson, Mississippi. It was a sight for sore eyes this evening, as we did see a lot of that damage. And Mr. Brander, Brandon Krill here in Inawaya, his woodshed was destroyed by a tree, ironically. But thankfully, they were all okay. No injuries uh, reported across our area, but in Neshoba County, they did have a fatality due to a tree falling on a vehicle. But here in Macon, we saw a lot of tree damage onto homes and just a lot of trees knocked down across the region. We saw a lot of rain once again. Again, out there, you see this big swath of two to three inches here through the Golden Triangle region. Most of us did pick up between one and three inches. Some of us saw even a little bit more than three inches of rain. Luckily, as we go into your Friday, though, not expecting any heavy rain, just some pesky little showers moving on through our area. So our severe threat is done. Showery and cool for Friday, but your Easter is looking really nice. We're going to see that sunshine return to our area. Cold tomorrow. It's going to be nasty. If you can stay inside, do it. Highs only in the middle 50s. Winds are going to be really gusty out of the northwest there, making it feel even colder than 56 degrees there in Reform. A Golden Triangle region, 57 start below 60 in Macon. You'll be lucky if you hit that thanks to the rain and clouds that we're expecting tomorrow. Futurecast doing a good job showing those rain showers throughout the early morning hours on Friday. Here at noon, headed out for lunch. You may want to bring that rain jacket or umbrella. A few patchy showers out there. We will begin to see things clear out for your Saturday. That sunshine returning. Warmer temperatures are going to return once that sunshine comes back on into your Saturday night and Sunday. No clouds, no rain to worry about. And we're going to see those highs back up into the 70s. Tomorrow and Saturday, we do have our severe weather radio programming at Saturday from 10 to noon there in Columbus at the Kroger. And then Friday, tomorrow, 3.30 to 5.30 p.m., we'll be at Durham's Pharmacy there in Vernon, Alabama. So be sure you come out and get your weather radios program so that you can be notified when severe weather moves in. Easter looking perfect, 78 degrees, nothing but sunshine. And then as we move on into your Monday and Tuesday, 80s return to the forecast, sunshine remaining. Wednesday and Thursday, more storms roll in. Nothing severe expected at this time. A week since two tornadoes touched down in Monroe County. The deadly storm left behind significant damage and debris that could take weeks to clean up. Uh, Quentin Smith, he speaks with county leaders about the debris removal. Quentin, do we have a timetable on when crews will clean up all of this debris? Well, Scott, at this time, that answer is unclear because they're still waiting on the president to issue a declaration and to receive federal assistance. This weekend's storm literally left behind tons of debris. Now, county leaders are actively searching for a contractor to come in and haul it all away. If you drive along McDuffie Cemetery Road in Monroe County, this is the site you'll see. Tree limbs lined all along the road. From shingles to personal and basic household items, this weekend's tornado left debris scattered everywhere. Best estimates is going to be 100 to 120,000 tons, which is, according to MEMA, uh, about as heavy as they've seen in a tornado like this. The storm left behind over a million dollars worth of damage. Monroe County Road Manager Sonny Clay says the rubbish is too much for the county to handle on their own. And as a result, they're now looking to bring in a contractor to haul it all away. We're working as we speak to get some requests for proposals out. Our goal is to, by the end of next week, to have some proposals to go out for contractors to submit bids on. Uh, we will uh, take those bids. Hopefully, we'll be able to take those bids, uh, analyze them, go through them, determine who's best qualified, who can do it the quickest and, and, and the best. However, the county won't be able to hire a contractor until a declaration is signed by the president. And at this time, Clay says he doesn't know how long that's going to take. Of course, Monroe County, the event that we had last Saturday night, is going to be tied in with Warren County and uh, Octobre County, and I think there was four places in the state that had damage last week. All of that would go in with one declaration to the president. We've got all hours together ready to go in. MEMA's working on getting it ready to go to FEMA now. But my understanding is that it won't be looked at until these other counties come in. In the meantime, Clay says they're urging all residents to push their debris to the edge of the road and be patient with them as they try to find a solution to get all of this debris cleaned up as quick as possible. We're probably looking at a $4 million contract. And Monroe County just didn't have $4 million to put out there on a limb without knowing that we're going to get reimbursed through a presidential declaration. Now, I do want to point out, just because they're waiting on the presidential declaration, Clay says they're still going to go out and try to haul away as much debris as they can. County leaders say it's their plan to already have a contractor lined up, and if this declaration is issued, they'll have the contracting group come in right away and get everything cleaned up.
All right, thank you very much, Quinn. Well, Vic Schaefer is itching for a chance to go duck hunting. Coming up a little later in sports, Tom has more on when he may get his chance. You're watching WCBI News at 10 with Scott Martin. The warmer temperatures bring out the worst in allergies for a lot of us. Tonight we discuss treatment for those pesky allergies in our Health Talk with Baptist. What are some treatments for spring allergies? The best way to stay allergy free is to avoid pollen as much as possible. Take these measures to keep pollen out of your home. Keep your windows and outside doors closed. Do not use window or attic fans during pollen season if possible. Roll up your car windows when driving. Dry clothing and bedding in the dryer and don't hang clothes outside. Remember that pets can bring pollen inside on their fur, so don't allow pets that spend time outdoors in your bedroom. We treat spring allergies with a number of over-the-counter prescription drugs. Over-the-counter allergy drugs are effective for many people and include nasal steroid sprays, which reduce inflammation. Antihistamines reduce sneezing, sniffling, and itching by lowering the amount of histamine in the body. Over-the-counter antihistamines often make you feel sleepy or tired, but many non-drowsy formulas are now available. Decongestants clear mucus out of the nasal passageways to relieve congestion and swelling. Decongestant nasal sprays relieve congestion and may clear clogged nasal passages faster than oral decongestants. Allergy testing is recommended in some cases which helps determine what you're allergic to. This can help better individualize your treatment through avoidance, medication timing, or immunotherapy. Join us next time for Health Talk with Baptist. Mail your topic suggestions to healthtalk at wcbi.com. Health Talk has been brought to you by Baptist Memorial Hospital Golden Triangle. Ole Miss looks to continue its success against Auburn, but could they get it done in the Plains? Highlights next in sports. CBI Sports with Tom Apple. The series between Ole Miss and Auburn on the baseball diamond has been a lot of hotty toddy of late. The Rebels have won five of its last six meetings with War Eagle, hoping to make it six out of seven. Mike Bianco and company traveling to the Plains. There's a tie ball game 1-1 in the second. The Rebels are going to take the lead in the second as well. Anthony Servideo with a base knock to right. That's going to score Jacob Adams. Now 2-1 Rebels. Staying in the inning, a 3-1 now after a great Kessinger sack fly. Thomas Dillard with a dribbler. Big Tom turning on the Jets. First baseman comes off the bag, so he's safe. Bring home another run, so the Rebels up 4-1. Everything looking good. But War Eagle would rally. Two men on. Eduardo Julian launches one to left. Off Auburn's version of the green monster out there in left field. Two run score on the two RBI single. Auburn goes six unanswered and takes game one of the series seven to four over Ole Miss. Going on right now because 8 o'clock first pitch, Mississippi State trailing Arkansas 3-2. This game is heading to the bottom of the eighth. It was a fantastic pitcher's duel if you were watching early on between Ethan Small and Isaiah Campbell. Small went four innings with a no-hitter, but Arkansas able to crack in to the Bulldogs' ace, ace, ace in the sixth inning, scoring three runs. So Small giving up three runs. That's the most he gave up all season long to this point. Bulldogs have three more outs remaining, and as of last check, it is three to two, bottom of the eighth, no outs for Arkansas. That game is over on ESPNU for those interested in watching the end of that one. Yet another homecoming for Ole Miss men's basketball. One day after West Point native Austin Crowley announces he'll be signing with the Rebels, Oxford's native son is coming back home. Former Oxford Charger star Jarkel Joyner will transfer to Ole Miss with two years of eligibility remaining. Joyner transfers from Cal State Bakersfield, scoring 15 points per game on 45% shooting in a sophomore campaign. Joyner will have to sit next year due to transfer rules, but reports say he'll return in 2020 as a redshirt junior. The guard was lightly recruited out of the class of 2017 after averaging 36 and a half points per game. Vic Schaefer says the number 88 won't get out of his head, 88 being the number of points Oregon scoring to defeat the Bulldogs in the Elite Eight. Schaefer also says you can count on one finger in which a team of his has lost scoring 84 points. But the Ducks and the Dogs are no strangers to each other, meeting four times over the past three seasons. Schaefer says he ran into Oregon head coach Kelly Graves at the Wooden Award ceremony 
and is already working on that rematch. I told Kelly when I shook his hand to leave that night, I said, let's play again. You know, let's start it up and play again. I, I just, I want to play again. I want to play them again, you know. And, uh, and so um, I got a text message from him uh, yesterday. And, and so we've talked about trying to start it back up in, uh, you know, in a year or two. Rain took away some college softball today, but it gives us a big day on Friday. SEC rivalry softball, number 17 Ole Miss in town of Starkville to take on Mississippi State. Doubleheader tomorrow, game one starting at 1 p.m., game two at 5 p.m., and then on Saturday, first pitch at 1 p.m. as well. Ole Miss, it's been all Rebels so far in the rivalry in the last 10. They've won six of the last 10 against Mississippi State. In case you missed out, Mississippi State baseball still trails Arkansas 3-2 in the bottom of the eighth. That game's over on ESPNU if you'd like to catch the finish. Also, with all the rain today, it might wreak havoc on the baseball and softball playoffs. If you have a change in your schedule, make sure to let us know. Tweet at me, Tom underscore Ebel, or at WCBI Sports, or email us at sports at WCBI.com to fill us in on any kind of updates. That's it for sports. Last of your weather is next. Severe weather threat has come to an end. We will see scattered showers for your Friday, keeping it cool highs in the middle 50s. Saturday, more sunshine, even more for your Sunday. Easter looking lovely highs in the upper 70s. Egg hunt forecast looking great. Sunshine stays around Monday and Tuesday before more rain and storms arrive for Wednesday and Thursday. We should go crash an Easter egg hunt. We should. I mean, I, if there's money in it. I, I could use some money egg down, right? Now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow.